welcome to our podcast on fraud in our backyard and beyond. My name is Chantal Naidu. I'm a senior forensic manager at Nexia SABNT. With me today are Bilal Jetton, who is the director of consulting and forensics and a partner at Nexia SABNT. I also have with me Sanjay Hargovan, who is a senior manager in risk management at Nexia SABNT, and Yaku Fenter, who is the head of the Cyber Forensics Laboratory at Nexia SABNT. As I've mentioned, we will be discussing fraud in our backyard and beyond. And we will be focusing on fraud in the context of the South African and global landscape, the ways in which we can avoid becoming victims of fraud, as well as cyber threats in relation to fraud. I would like to start with Bilal. Bilal, can you explain to us what the South African landscape looks like in terms of fraud? Fraud uh, committed in South Africa is quite prevalent. What we are finding though is that fraud is being perpetrated by senior management and this is on the increase. It's also resulted in the value of the losses being increased as well over the period of time. Which actually makes quite sense because senior management has the ability to override controls and deal with higher value transactions. Most fraud that is perpetrated in South Africa can be classified as either customer fraud, where a person suffers a financial loss as a result of deceptive, unfair or false business practices. It's also an element of identity theft, especially with credit cards, bank accounts, charge cards, charge purchases, etc. The other types of fraud committed in South Africa is bribery and corruption, financial statement fraud and one of the most prevalent areas is cybercrime. Thank you, Bilal. Can you take us through how South Africa compares to the rest of the world with regards to the prevalence of fraud? So the ACFE publishes a report annually called the Report of the Nations. In 2020, South Africa featured 73rd out of 180 countries in terms of the Corruption Perception Index. 180 being the most corrupt country and first being the least corrupt country. South Africa features close to the middle in terms of that corruption index. It must be noted that over the years, South Africa has been going lower and lower and lower in terms of this corruption index. South Africa, in terms of BRICS, ranks the best in terms of the corruption perception index. In terms of SADC, only Botswana, Mauritius, uh, Namibia and Seychelles rank below us, meaning that they are less corrupt compared to South Africa in terms of this perception index. PwC did a survey in 2020 where it was found that the fraud report rate dropped from 77% to 60%. Now this means that people reporting the fraud feel that they rather not report the fraud or alternatively nothing is happening about the fraud, therefore they don't want to report the fraud. We still have a high report rate at 60%, but it's been dropping over the years. South Africa ranks third in the top 10 rankings of reported economic crime of countries in the world just behind India and China. PwC survey also reports that in terms of the report rate of economic crime per region, Africa ranks number one at 58%. Fraud is prevalent and increasing in our very own backyard. The fraud triangle um, specifically highlights that there's either an incentive or a motivation to perform the fraud, a rationalization of the fraud, an opportunity to commit the fraud, and some experts additionally indicate that there's a capability to commit the fraud. What I'm trying to highlight here is that there's opportunity to commit the fraud and that's the main prevalent reason that there is opportunity to commit the fraud with little or no repercussions once the fraud is committed because there's no monitoring that is being done by management. There is a whole lot of factors that provide these opportunities. So there's no internal controls, there's lack of monitoring, there's lack of segregation of duties, etc, etc. Also, according to the survey, one in five South Africans have cited that bribery and corruption as the economic crime with the most disruptive impact. In 2018, 42% of South Africans indicated that they have been asked to pay a bribe in the course of doing their business. 
the global figure in this regard is 29%. So we're already above the world average in terms of bribery and corruption. South Africa is also faced with various schemes relating to corruption and fraud. One of the most common areas of procurement fraud in specifically in the public sector, which we know is something that is quite rife and that's in the media a lot. The procurement fraud schemes occur such as collusion amongst the service providers, which include schemes such as complementary bidding, bid rotation, suppression, market division. There's also collusion between service providers and procurement employees, such as fabricated needs, bid tailoring, bid splitting, manipulation, leaking of bid documents, unjustified sourcing bidding, and several other non-competitive schemes. Defective pricing schemes as well is something that we've identified, as we all know, from the COVID-19 lockdown and the PPE procurements. There was a whole lot of inflated prices that was highlighted in the media at various institutions around the country. The discussions on procurement fraud in South Africa and on a global stage is one which covers too many aspects to actually be able to discuss it in, in detail. In South Africa, in the private sector listed space, in the recent past, we, we all know about Steinhoff matter, which deals with um, financial statement fraud specifically, the use of other companies that were linked to the former CEO, as well as other off-balance sheet companies used to either remove from Steinhoff some of the liabilities or boost up the income in those underperforming entities. Tonga Hewlett is another one of those entities that indicated that their company's business performance does not reflect accurately in their financial statements, from past financial statements, and uh, they indicated that their uh, financial statements were overstated between 3.5 and 4.5 billion rand. So these are financial statement frauds. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal, for that. You've provided quite a lot of insight there in terms of a fraud in South Africa and on the global scale. And I think it's quite an eye-opener if um, not already realized by our listeners. You've mentioned customer fraud previously and that it is quite prevalent as a fraud scheme that's being perpetrated. Can we then assume that not all fraud that is perpetrated involves company employees or officials? Yes, uh, Chantal, uh, that is correct. About a third of fraud that takes place does not involve officials of the organization itself. These are perpetrated by customers, hackers and organized crime. According to the 2020 survey, 36% of economic crime in South Africa is perpetrated by external individuals, whilst 41% of the perpetrators are internal staff. Collusion between external and internal individuals accounts for 21% of our economic crime. This further highlights the need to strengthen our controls or the controls in place. Verifying customer details becomes very important. Authorizing the change of customer details equally important. As I mentioned before, organized crime which is ID theft, is quite significant and prevalent. Um, hacking in the financial services space is quite prevalent. So there's a lot that is committed by individuals outside the organization, and entities need to take precautions both internally and externally with their control system structures in place. Thank you. From your response, um, people probably feel that the effort to report such fraud is not worth it because we're dealing with low values. However, they're failing to see that it does have quite a huge impact uh, on our economy as well as the organizations in which they work. Bilal, in your response, you mentioned hacking and hackers. Can you discuss this further with us, provide some insight in this regard? So, as we all know, hackers are unauthorized users who break into computer systems um, in order to steal, change or access uh, information, either by installing malware or without the knowledge of the entity, or key logging devices, or just plain down being able to hack through a system. 
we've got a client right now where the entity key logging devices have been installed on certain officials' computers where they then get access to the usernames and passwords of officials and then process fictitious transactions on the client systems. Typically what these would entail is that either there's a valid transaction on the system or alternatively they would add fraudulent transactions at high amounts and then process those to fraudulent banking accounts. Now, at this client here specifically, we've identified over the last two years about 200 million rand of fraudulent transactions that have been processed using these this modus. And these typically syndicate-driven hacking, um, you do get other types of hackers, uh, but predominantly we're identifying that the syndicates are using these moduses. And the syndicates actually have people within the organization that work with them to defraud the entity that they are working for. Thank you, Bilal. Um, organized crime, uh, you've mentioned syndicates. So organized crime is also one of the major reasons why um, fraud is increasing. Uh, people are able to work together, um, each one has a role to play to commit that fraud. On that topic of organized crime, I think it's one of the things as well that um, institutions need to be aware of and also the legislation applicable to it when investigating um, occurrences of fraud when they are unable to prevent it and they are now reactive in nature. Um, can you take us through some of the legislation? Obviously, uh, the list is quite long and what you would provide would not be exhaustive, but anything off the top of your head um, from your experience that you've applied in investigations? Uh, the PFMA and the MFMA in public sector, uh, where one has to report any suspected fraud of 100,000 rand and above. The Criminal Procedures Act comes to mind. POCA, the Companies Act, Financial Intelligence Center Act, Competition Act, Protected Disclosures Act. Uh, these are uh, mainly the, the, the main ones that come to mind. There obviously are others as well. However, you know, in terms of legislation, we have good legislation governing fraud in South Africa. However, as I indicated at the onset, the repercussions of committing fraud in South Africa is not there. So, by the time a fraud gets committed to the time that person gets caught to the time a person goes to trial for the fraud to the time the person gets sentenced into prison for committing the fraud takes 5, 10, 15 years to take place. Now that gives a person incentive to commit fraud over and over again because over time these case dockets either get lost or alternatively the investigators are no longer available so these things get swept under the carpet. It takes time for the wheels of justice to turn for the person to be incarcerated. Now, that gives a lot of incentive to a lot of the syndicates because they see that it's being committed across the board and there's just no implications for anybody. And therein lies the issue. Thank you. And I think also as forensic investigators, I think it is important that investigators do know this legislation and apply it in terms of, of determining contraventions to ensure that your case is watertight. We tend to rely on only certain legislation, but like you've mentioned, the Organized Crime Act, those are all very important, the Companies Act as well. And I think uh, uh, a lot of the time, these are overlooked by investigators and prosecutors. And it's important that we bring in every single contravention when we deal with the outcomes of our investigations. Bilal, in terms of fraud on the international landscape, is there anything that you can discuss in that respect for us? The number of organizations that actually experience fraud ranks third in the world just behind India and China. It's, it's significant. That means almost every organization in the country has experienced some level of fraud. There was an article that I read by Les Doby in January 2020, where it explained that regardless of country, location, community, governments are expected to manage public money prudently in order to maintain the social 
contract between the state and the people. However, governments are either failing or struggling to ensure that public money is not lost through fraud and corruption. According to Transparency International's Global Corruption Barometer, 57% of the world population thinks that governments are not faring very well in the fight against fraud and corruption. Um, according to that article, uh, the United Nations estimates that at least $3.6 trillion is paid globally in bribes or acquired through other corrupt means. Thank you very much, Bilal. Um, you've provided a lot of insightful information. Sanjay, um, Bilal has highlighted the prevalence of fraud in South Africa and various types of fraud of concern. Based on what Bilal has discussed with us regarding the prevalence of fraud in South Africa, what advice would you give our listeners to avoid being a victim of fraud? Thanks, Chantal. Um, it has been found that fraud normally lasts around 14 months before it is detected. And obviously, the longer that fraud is not detected, the worse the financial impact or the financial losses will be on an organization. Globally and in South Africa, what is of concern is that just over 50% of cases are investigated. Furthermore, the majority of incidences are not reported to the auditors and just about 50% is reported to the board. Therefore, the first piece of advice I will give um, to organizations is to ensure that all fraud is initially reported to the board, the law enforcement agencies and if applicable in the industry you are in, the regulators, um, and ensure that a investigation is carried out. It is important that an organization develops a fraud management policy or framework. Typically, this policy will highlight the high-risk areas of the organization. It will state the management's posture on fraud by means of a fraud statement. It outlines the roles and responsibilities within the organization when it comes to management of fraud, as well as then categorizing the fraud that takes place in an organization, as well as providing examples thereof. When we talk about categorization of fraud, we can categorize the fraud internally as well as externally. By that I mean fraud that is perpetrated within the organization and fraud, as was mentioned earlier, that is perpetrated by outside people. The categories that you will use are asset misappropriation, financial statement fraud, and corruption. In terms of the external fraud, the categorization will be industry specific and will not necessarily be constant across different companies and organizations. It's also important that we create a strong ethical culture within an organization with the board and management leading the way. Thank you, Sanjay. It's interesting that you've mentioned ethical culture. Um, we so far, we've been focusing on fraud from a legal perspective and the identification of fraud and the types of fraud. With regards to ethical culture, how would an organization ensure that a strong ethical culture is established and inculcated within the organization and amongst the employees? Firstly, there should be a mission statement that refers to the quality and to ethics and defines how the organizations wants to be regarded externally. Further, clear policy statements on business ethics and anti-fraud with explanations about acceptable behavior from officials within the organization. In addition, channels through which suspected fraud can be reported, such as an anonymous fraud hotline, should be set up, where whistleblowers are able to report fraud without fear or victimization. A process of reminders about ethical and fraud policies should also be set up by an organization. This could be done via annual newsletters, via the organization's website, and then an aggressive audit process which concentrates on the areas of risk which are more prevalent in that organization. Management also needs to be seen to be committed to these actions and need to lead from the top. Lastly, it is vital that training is provided to staff so they can identify fraud, they are aware of what the red flags are, and they also understand the channels that are at their disposal to report fraud without fear or intrepidation. Thank you, Sanjay. You mentioned fraud risk assessments as one of the measures that can be taken within an organization. Can you discuss with us fraud risk assessments and what they are about, their purpose, and how they would help to achieve the reduction in fraud. Sure. So if you look at COSO, 
COSO defines risks as the possibility that events will occur and affect the achievements of strategy and business objectives. This includes both negative effects, such as reduction in the revenue targets, as well as positive impacts, that is, opportunities such as emerging markets. It involves identifying events and if they have a negative impact on the organization and the implementing actions that the organization should take to mitigate the risks. Organizations can utilize the risk management methodology that is used in a normal risk management process in order to conduct a risk assessment. The risk management cycle is an interactive process of identifying risks, assessing their impact and prioritizing actions to control and reduce risks. The following steps should ideally be taken. Firstly, you establish a risk management group and you set your goals. You identify your risk areas, understand and assess the scale of the risk, develop a risk response strategy, implement the strategy and allocate responsibilities to mitigate the risk, implement and monitor the suggested controls, and then review and redefine your process. What's important to note is that fraud risks should be assessed for each area and within each process of the business. When developing a fraud risk register, one can utilize the same methodology that is in the risk management framework in developing the fraud risk register. Thank you, Sanjay. So once this fraud risk register that you refer to is compiled, what would be the next step? Once the fraud risk registers are developed, the risk should be ranked in order of severity. By that we mean they should be ranked from the highest risk to the lowest risk. So management is then aware of which risks should be mitigated first and where additional resources should be allocated. A fraud risk universe should be developed to understand the areas of the business and the types of risk that relate to them. Action plans should be developed to mitigate the risks. These could be preventive controls, an example of which is segregation of duties or detection measures. These involve use of analytical and other procedures to highlight anomalies. Fraud indicators should also be developed, which are automated to highlight to management when a threshold or red flag has been breached. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, so you've highlighted to us the importance of conducting fraud risks within organizations and obviously the, the importance of regular monitoring of these risks to ensure that the factors and the steps put in place or the controls put in place are effective to reduce fraud, which I think is vital in our pursuance as forensic and fraud investigators to reduce fraud. Thank you for your input and your insight, Sanjay. With us, as explained, we also have Yaku, who is the head of our Cyber Forensics Lab. Yaku, Bilal did touch a bit on hacking and cyber fraud. We would like you to take us through the types of fraud schemes that are perpetrated, seeing that in this day and age, we find that digital and cyber fraud has increased. In respect to this discussion, can you also indicate what can be done to prevent and or reduce a company's risk to cyber fraud? So, um, we have our hands full these days with certain particular cyber threats on a daily basis whereby people will call us and just explain to us what they encountered and to see if we can identify the perpetrator and who committed this particular fraud and to show that if they were not involved, have been framed. So. As you can imagine, there's so many cyber threats currently in South Africa and even in the globe. I would just like to focus on four main cyber threats that we encounter on a daily basis in South Africa currently. The first thing is identity theft. So there's various ways of stealing your identity, you know, copy of your ID, open bank accounts with uh, false documentation. You can even purchase a car recently which I've done in a case whereby this particular, the whole deal was with false documentation. Even the driver's license was false. Okay, so that's one type of identity theft. But today I would like to talk about the electronic part of it, the key logging part of it. So basically, what the perpetrators will do, they will steal your identity, your username or password, call it credentials, via key logger, either a hardware key logger device, which they put in on your computer between a keyboard and your USB device or they plant software on your device which then as soon as you log in every morning then it records your credentials doesn't matter if you change your password every day it still records it we've done recently a case whereby one of the 
security guys planted this particular hardware keylogger into a desktop computer, left it there for a day, and the next morning another colleague went to collect it. So unfortunately, the user that was using that computer was not fully aware of that scenario. If you don't know about what is, is going on in your computer or you, you don't witness um, that particular insertion of that particular keylogger, you won't be even know that you've been keylogged. Another thing is with this COVID, we've seen a huge increase in remote activity because people work remotely. They don't physically get to the office. So they use remote desktop tools or like for instance, AnyDesk or TeamViewer. There's so many remote access tools in the country or on the globe that you can use. And the forces then obviously abuse that particular applications. So they will then get into your system and they will plant this particular software keylogger on your computer. Okay, so that's the sort of two methods that we recently discovered. And it's as old as way back in the 90s when I started in cyber forensics. Take cognizance of it. The second thread I would really want to discuss is the concept called spear phishing. So people will then send you an email just to try and get information out of you. So that's the main, the main concept about phishing. The concept of spear phishing is more an advanced sort of way of getting information. In spear phishing, this particular perpetrator will focus on individuals within your organization, like for instance, the CEO or people within the finance department, because as soon as they get more information of how, um, say for instance, who is involved uh, doing the entire process of uh, paying invoices of paying salaries, etc., etc., the better idea this perpetrator will have. So then he will then intercept your email. The third threat that we currently experience is intellectual property theft. So we've got a huge problem whereby people will resign from your organization, steal your hard worked sort of intellectual property and sell it to the biggest bidder or the highest bidder on the black market or to their competitions as we speak. Uh, we've done recently a case whereby the guy resigned say January the 31st and then he had to work his notice period. And the day before he leaves the company, he stole almost the entire server content, including the IP, the secret drawings, the code, specific email content, etc., etc. What he wasn't aware of is that the fact that the company itself had monitoring software installed on all their computers. And um, the day he had his exit interview, they asked him to provide them with that particular device which he copied. So that was unfortunate for him. So he was caught. So guys, that is a reality as well. You know, intellectual property is a big thing these days. People pay a lot of money for serious information like credit card details because Frauds is all about how they can make money. They don't do this for, for fame. The last and the fourth threat that I'd like to discuss is a global phenomenon, which is called ransomware. I read an article in, I think it was early 2020, there was over 14, 15 million emails sent out with this particular ransomware, whereby they will send you an email, ask you to click on a link, and as soon as you click on the link, it will encrypt your entire hard drive. They will keep you then ransom for your content and without paying them a particular Bitcoin or whatever they uh, normally ask, um, you can't access your data. And that's the fourth sort of high level cyber threats we're dealing on a daily basis here in South Africa. I would like just to go on to your prevention question. I'm glad you actually mentioned the prevention part of the cyber crime. As they say, prevention is better than cure. We found that most of our cases, none of our clients were really geared in the necessary prevention measures or had the necessary prevention measures in place, which was what I'd like to suggest is an awareness campaign. For you to be aware of certain vulnerabilities within your organization, and you need to understand and you need to be advised on what the current scenario is out there. So many people is currently aware of ransomware and they just need to Put the necessary uh, measurements in place but for key logging i strongly suggest on a daily basis just check at the bio back of it if there's any foreign devices connected to it make alert speak to your it security guy even phone the police if it needs to be because 
that could potentially be our keylogger. And another thing is we've done a recent case whereby um, a black box, we call it the black box, was found in the office. That was called the man in the middle device. So basically what the perpetrators does is they connect this device to your network with a SIM card in and they can sit anywhere in the world to remote into that particular device and then they're on your domain. So as soon as they key log you, they've got full access to your entire system. Then the second thing is what I mentioned earlier, one of the threats is they will plant the keyloggers, the software keyloggers. The first thing that the perpetrators will do, whether it's IT people or the nearest guy next to you, he will disable your antivirus. Then plant this particular software keylogger and once you log in, all the key stress gets logged onto a specific file hidden on your computer. And then later on, when you go to the bathroom or if you're working remotely, they will remote into your computer without your knowledge and just grab that particular file. When, it, when we deal with email spoofing and an email interception, the very first thing that I will do is ensure that two-factor authentication is enabled on all your email system. Basically what this means is if they do steal your username and password, they can't log in without this particular verification pin. It's similar to the banking systems. If you add a beneficiary and needs to be paid, it will ask you for that pin. It's the same with this. You can even enable it on your Gmail. If you don't know, Google it or ask your IT administrator or you're more than welcome to phone us for help. The second thing I will check for email spoofing is, it's basically email spoofing is when the sender email address is false. On the email header, uh, on the display name of an email, it will show you, for instance, your name. But back, in the header of the information, the reply address will totally be different. If you do get a suspicious mail, just make sure that the reply address, you do reply to the same email address that was sent to you. Get a impersonation sort of filter. There is certain remedies that you can install on your email system to remedy this. So basically what it checks is for you automatically, it compares the sender's email address with the reply email address. And if it's a mismatch, it will warn you immediately. It will say, this email could be potentially suspect. So please act on it and report it immediately. Because if you do reply, you might send out confidential information or you might be a victim of fraud. If a mail comes in from a supplier that I owe money to, they will intercept it, they will put in keywords, for instance, like invoice. So the rule will say, if there's any email coming in to this mailbox with the keyword invoice, just forward it to my Gmail account. Then I'm fully aware of this money is supposed to be paid out. What the perpetrators then do is intercept that email, change the bank details of the invoice, and voila, you pay it into the wrong account. So I would definitely recommend that employers consider a covert monitoring application onto the systems. So this will help you to monitor all activity from your local computer. If you can even do it on your local computer at home for your kids, etc. Just to see what are they doing, what are they accessing. I've done a recent case whereby the guys were playing innocent games. They downloaded the crack. That particular crack caused them millions of rands because the crack contained the keylogger device. Just be careful. But this particular covert monitoring application will help you determine who access what in your organization. The last thing I would say, set proper passwords. There's various ways of getting ransomware attached to your computer, but the most common way is via emails. So first of all, I will get a ransomware detection tools in implemented on your email system, which will then basically scan each and every email, unpack it and see if that particular content or attachment leads to any ransom. The second thing that we encountered that these fraudsters will scan your network or the scan the network throughout the globe. As soon as you get open port on your system, which was vulnerable, they will steal your username via the SAM file. So the SAM file is basically, that's the file on your Windows computer that contains your username and password. They will do then a brute force attack and then they've got access to your computer. Then they plant this particular ransomware and then encrypt your data without your knowledge. And the next morning when you get there, you see all your data is basically encrypted. What I also suggest is get a secondary backup system in place. Within your firm, 
but just being on a secondary system. It can be restored within minutes and you back up and running. Thank you. Thank you, Yaku, for that information. Um, I must say that was indeed a mouthful. Um, there was a lot of terminology. I'm sure many of our listeners are hearing for the first time. We do know that fraudsters are getting very inventive and as technology improves, so do their methods of committing fraud. With that being said, our listeners, that is all we have for today. If you wish to contact us, you can do so on the channels below. Thank you for tuning in once again, and I hope that this podcast has added some value to you in your fight against fraud and corruption and other economic crimes. I would like to thank the panel and all our listeners for tuning in.